good evening everyone good evening i think we can start um dr ashita are you here yeah hi hello just give me a second yeah i'm just going to open this up give me a second um Hi guys there's pretty much a lot of turnout I can see my sister in there hi pri uh-huh. I guess it's 12:30 in the afternoon there right it's about 12:30 yes it is all right so i guess we can start now we have a pretty good number of participants yeah okay then uh so good evening everyone and good afternoon dr ashita uh welcome to the first episode of the very first season of rc medicruz build your future series the ultimate flap guide with dr ashita nayar we are very lucky to have got the chance to be guided by a doctor who has been working in the nhs for the past one and a half years we really could not pro- possibly ask for a better guide and we'll be eternally grateful to dr naya for being with us today despite her very busy schedule dr ashita naya hails from the state of kerala india and completed her mbbs from amrita institute of medical sciences she is currently working as a junior clinical fellow in hepatobiliary surgery at kings college hospital london despite working continuous nights for the past one week dr ashita was sweet enough to agree to give us this session as soon as i approached her and Thank you so much Dr. Ashita for that. So like you all know the first season will be all about uh, flab and the UK. We will be covering every possible topic that we can think about in the forthcoming episodes and in case you guys have any specific requests or any topics that you want specifically to be covered you can just let us know or drop them drop your suggestions in the post event form. the post event form will be sent in the meeting chat itself and i request all the participants to fill it with their personal details and also leave feedback for the organizers as well as for the speaker attendees who are medicru members will be receiving certificates for each season not for each webinar but for each season you will be required to attend at least 80% of the episodes to avail to receive a certificate for a season so make sure you attend at least four of the five episodes we have planned for our flab season So without wasting much time I would now like to request Dr Ashita to take over. We will also have a question answer session towards the end of the webinar. So I request all the attendees to kindly save their doubts for the end or put them in the chat box and we can get to them later after the after Dr Ashita sir. So that's it from my side. Over to you Dr. Ashita. Thanks. Um hi guys. Uh firstly, thank you so much for being here. I know it's um on a Sunday. Everybody wants to just be at home and do nothing like I would. And but this is an amazing amazing place and I really actually it's a pretty good turnout which I'm actually pretty excited about. Um before we start, I just want to um ask where in all is everybody from? If we could just turn on the chat box. I just want to see as to where on everybody is from. like places in india where are you from ah there we go we get we getting a lot of responses ah mumbai chennai thane hyderabad cochin i saw cochin yes kerala very good delhi tirupati kochi goa mumbai kerala mumbai and oof i've got everywhere nice yes and i see my cousin brother has also re- replied kerala navin i know you're from there okay no, okay chennai indore amazing tamil nadu okay so many so many philippines <laughs> yes i know who you are okay amazing all right so thank you so much for being here um what i'm going to start with is this is the first session of 
four seasons, four sessions, as we all know. So I'm just going to give you a gist of what it is, um, of how to get into the UK and why I selected the UK. Um, my, my story is a little funny, but we'll get to that in the end. Um, right. So we have, are we all ready to start? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen with you all now. If you cannot see, can you please ask? Yes, Sonika, I know you're there. <laughs> um, can we please, uh, if you cannot see or if you cannot hear me, can anybody please like reply now so that I can adjust anything or do something about it? Everybody can see and hear everything. Hope so. All right. I'm going to take the silence as a yes, and I'm going to keep going. Right. Very good. Everybody is visible. Everybody is audible. Okay. So welcome all. Uh, we're going to start off with the pathway to UK as to the things that I'm going to cover today is why I chose the UK. What's the difference between the USMLE and the PLAB exams? Um, a little bit about what are the levels of uh, the different types of doctors? in the UK and different pathways of how you can get into the UK. All right. All right. Let me just share my screen with you because I made a very tiny um, presentation. Okay. Very tiny one. So let's just see. Right. Can everybody see it? I need to know if everybody can see actually the, the presentation. All right. So first, poll time. I need to know how many people vote for US Assembly and how many people vote for the PLAB. At least where you've tried to like, you know, okay, I might do the US Assembly or so I, might, I might do the PLAB. Which one do you guys prefer? PLAB, 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 PLAB. Okay, US Assembly, US Assembly, try for US Assembly, PLAB. Both USM new plab. All right, there's a lot of answers coming, and I see that at least a little bit more than 50 is plab, a little bit is USM new, and some people have said both very interestingly. Okay. Right, so before we get into as to how different the USM new and how different the plab is, let me just tell you one thing. Yes, I've tried for both the USM new and the plab. Um, you kind of must have figured out how the USM new went because I'm sitting here in the UK. So didn't really, let's just say, go according to plan. Right, next. Okay. Now, let's get through down to the business of what's the difference between US Emily and what's the difference between PLAB. Um, this is pros and cons of both of them. And I would really, really like it if nobody, like, you know, judges, oh my God, this is so difficult, or this is so difficult, I'm going to go for this. Because everything depends upon your research. Everything depends upon what you feel like you can do and where you, in the end, want to work. Um, everybody has a sort of goal in their life, see, 10 years down the line, I want, to, I want to be here, or five years down the line, I want to be here. It depends on how hard you are willing to work to get to your goal. So just a couple of differences between what the US Emily and what the PLAB holds. One, um, the US Emily, as we all know, is, a three, is three exams. Um, I know they've taken out, I think, step to CS, if, to my knowledge. They have taken out step, step to CS uh, very recently. So I'm not quite sure as to what they have brought in instead of that or whether they've just completely like just taken that out. But before, at least before the pandemic hit, there was three exams um, and there were step one, step two CK, step two CS and step three. But usually a lot of people do take step three only after they get in. Um, the next thing that I want to tell you is, so a USMLE is three exams. You have one, two, three, and PLAP has got two exams, one and two. In the USMLE, your step one is usually just an, uh, sorry, it's a uh, multiple choice question. 
in your step two is again it's divided into multiple choice and no ski whereas in the plab you have just the plab one is a, a multiple choice and your plab two is an oski the cost of each exam is completely different um us assembly has got a very high cost to what i know the step one itself is about 63000 rupees if i'm not mistaken um so it's about 60 to 70000 rupees whereas in the plab it is जो मैंने आपको भेजा है सॉरी आई थिंक सब राइट गाइस सॉरी कैन यू हियर मी नाउ आई होप एवरीबॉडी कैन हियर मी आई एम जस्ट गोइंग टू कीप कंटिन्यूइंग यस ओके आई हैव गॉट इट आई हैव गॉट यस ऑल राइट सो the us assembly the step one i think it's about 65000 to 70000 to what i remember things they might have increased they might have not increased but this is i remember something because i gave the step one so i this is a, approximately what it is but the plab one starts from like about 25 to 30 and then it increases for your oski so yes finances are very very important in all of this um you need to understand that where you are willing to go with your finances um difficulty level regarding each of the exams the us assembly is definitely more difficult it's an 8 to 9 hour exam each exam is an 8 to 9 hour exam so it takes longer the hard work longer the prep time um and you need to basically know your course to the max whereas the plab exams it is two exams um and um the first one the plab one which i said is the mcq one is definitely doable if you have a job um a lot of people do study plab one along with their job and they easily pass it so i think it's very very easy to do the plab one even with the job but with the us assemblies i would definitely not recommend it you need to study full time for that um so attempts wise now in the us assembly um once you get through the like as in if you're writing your step 1 for let's just say step 1 if you're writing your step 1 if you pass that's it that's your score like and especially with the us assembly your score matters so much that because it depends on your scores as to where you would be ranked as well as of the interviews where you'll be ranked but in the clubs it's definitely or not about the score it's about pass or fail nobody cares about your score if you pass you're on to the next exam or you're on to the whatever the next pathway but that's it there's no oh i've got this much where will i rank nothing like that um entry wise also i think the reason why usmle does this is because it gives you a rank and that's when you get into training um where as in plabs it's just just a licensing exam it's a registering exam it is basically writing your um fmgs kind of thing where you write the exam you are registered as a doctor but that does not mean you're going to get into a training post or you're going to get into a residency post it means that you are licensed to work in the uk as a doctor all right let me go to the next slide okay so as i said that for the us assembly there's absolutely no other pathway if you want to actually work completely with the like in the residency program there's no other pathway that you can use but as in the clubs you can enter as a specialist pathway so there's something called a specialist pathway that is people for people who've done mrcp or mrcs and there's something called the mti pathway which is completely different um but if you finished your mrcp or mrcs or any other equivalent exams higher post graduate membership exams like you have your um, for emergency medicine i think you have your mcm or mrcam something like that if you finish these exams you can enter the uk without giving the plabs so that is another good thing about it what else oh the pay the pay wise um us is definitely definitely higher like whatever said and done 
they pay a lot and quality of life is also better in the in the us but if you compare it to the uk i wouldn't know how the quality of life is in the us because i have not stayed there per se but i do know compared to, to india it is definitely definitely higher uk i'm honest to god it's not bad at all i absolutely love it i love staying in the uk it's completely different from what i even imagined what it could be the pay is good i'm not saying it's bad it's good way better than what you would get in the uk um i'll come to the pay scales a little while later um but i'm not going to be able to give you how much a us doctor um is basically gets as a salary because i haven't worked there and i know it kind of varies so that's that work timing wise as a junior doctor in the nhs i can say that we have a contract as to where we cannot work in a week for more than 48 hours so yes i know uh, i was introduced in the fact that i have just done five nights that's because we have shortages in our rota and one of my colleagues had to get redeployed to the itu so somebody had to cover her night so i covered that night so i was doing monday to thursday nights and then i had to do friday as well because if there was a gap in the rota anybody could have done that night but because i was doing i was already on nights i said listen it's fine i'll continue with it but it doesn't go to a waste because that's my extra night and i will get paid extra it's not like okay you're working extra so it's easy for you to you know like you know not get paid but no you get paid for anything that you do extra all right so this is basically a little bit difference between what the usmd and plabs is let's move on right okay okay nhs now what is the nhs nhs is the national health service it is the government um as we say in india the government um medical colleges of so we here it's a government hospital so i'm going to it's it's not exactly like that but let me give you a little bit of an introduction all right what we're going to do in this is uh, my next few slides is going to be what is the nhs how does it work the different levels of doctors as i said pay scale in the uk the specialist pathway that's mrcp of mrcs and the plab pathway now what is the national health service the national health service is basically it's a publicly funded healthcare it's funded by general taxation so that means everybody in the uk who works pays tax right now if you pay tax that tax goes into a public fund and you get free healthcare there is no difference between rich young poor insurance person who has insurance person who does not insurance nothing like that you work in the uk or you do not work in the uk whatever it is if you are in the uk with a valid visa whether it's dependent whether it's spouse or anything student visa you are and if you have an nhs number which is easily and you know you can get it easily you are absolutely okay to get free healthcare there are some let's say exceptions to that like dental treatments cosmetic treatments that and all will not be included but any other anything whether you need to have a surgery it's free after your stay you will not get a bill of saying this charge this charge this charge nothing now of the uh, the uk per se as we say geographically it is somebody is very nicely writing on my <laughs> um page okay i'm going to leave that as it is but let me just continue in saying this um the uk geographically is divided into england wales scotland and northern ireland each of this combines itself to make the nhs so you have the nhs england you have the nhs scotland nhs uh, wales and the health and social care in northern ireland all right 
So what can you get in the NHS? Now, visiting a doctor or a nurse at and for anything is free. Getting help or treatment at a hospital, if you are, let's say, unwell, or if you just wanna have a checkup, it's free. Um, if you are seeing a midwife, if you're pregnant, free. Your delivery, free. Getting like urgent help, like as in if you are, um, you call the ambulance for some reason, you call 911 saying that because either you're stabbed, let's just say you're stabbed, or let's just say you've got a severe asthma attack or an anaphylactic attack or chest pain. You call the ambulance and they come, they assess you, they, they take you to the um, hospital free. No one is going to charge you anything for this. All right, um, where is my next page? Right, so, as if, as I said, free healthcare. So you cannot put off healthcare saying that I do not have insurance because that works in the US, but not here. You get, you need to go see a doctor if something is wrong because you know it won't affect you financially. That's taken care of. So as we said, midwife is free. If you need any um, emergency services, free screening programs. Now, as we said, screening programs for an appropriate age is given at no cost. Now, when we say what are the screening programs, we have pap smears. Everybody above the, every girl above the age of 25 gets a pap smear every three years until unless it's abnormal. So that's done, that's free. Contraception, anybody can walk in at any point of time at, at a doctor's clinic and say, okay, or at a sexual health center saying that, I need contraception, free. You need to put in a coil, you need to put in um, any intrauterine system, free. No one is gonna charge you for this. Now, because it is a publicly um, funded system by the taxes, there's loads of job opportunities. I know it's a little bit up and down these days, but I'll get to that later. Um, mental health, definitely mental health is something that is so advocated over here. Um, it was a bit of a shock for me when I came from India to here as to understand how much mental mental health actually has an importance. I realized that only here is because when you see patients and when you see them in the hospital for a very long period of time, you don't re really realize that they've been affected quite a lot mentally because they can't see their friends, especially with the pandemic. They can't see anybody from outside. They're just confined into one bed and they just get to see basically our faces every day. It's us and the nurses and probably the physios. They don't get to see anybody else. Um, yes, video call is there, but it's not like having your actual person with you. So mental health is very, very widely advocated over here which is quite nice because you can walk up to your doctor and say, I don't think I'm feeling okay. And that's it. Just It's just your step, your willingness to go ahead and take one step. Um, and it's just pension. Now, the reason why I kept this for the last is that um, a lot of people won't know what an NHS pension is. When you start working for the UK, an NHS pension is you get a salary. So if you get a certain salary, they will cut a little bit from that to put in something called the NHS pension. Every month, things uh, a bit of your salary is taken for NHS pension, but it's not like you can't live with the rest of the salary. It's more than enough. Now, the thing, good thing about this is after you retire, after working, in, it has its, you know, as we say, terms and conditions apply. But what I've seen is after you finish working for the NHS and after you have retired at the appropriate age, your financially you're covered because you start getting your NHS pension. And if you work for about 20 years, you get all of the money back that you've actually put into your NHS pension. So which is pretty good because you, whatever you have actually earned, you're getting it back. So, NHS pension is something that in the UK, even a private job will not have the NH as good NHS pension as they say. Okay, let's move on. Now, 
different levels of doctors in the UK. Now, I'm going to give you a short just description of how many different levels of doctors are there in the UK and how it's actually categorized. Um, it's way different from the system in India. It's way different from the system in US. So let's get on to that. Okay, so as you've seen over here, we have um, foundation year one and two. Now, after a me British medical graduate is graduated from medical school, they have two years of internship rather than us where we have only one. Um, in their two years of internship, they get to choose where and all they will be working as in, let's just say they have, they can choose four months of general surgery, four months of colorectal surgery, four months of anything, acute medicine, absolutely fine. All right, so they have two years and we have only one. Oops, let me just go back. Uh, hold on, guys, let me just go back here and show you that. Okay, so core training. Now, after you finish your two years of um, foundation year, as they call it over here, you get into core training. Um, a lot of students do, a um, lot of British medical graduates, that is, they tend to go off, they either take a year break, as in they, they do an FY3 here. Um, that is basically like us, as soon as we finished, like, you know, graduated. And if we don't, don't get through the needs or we have some other circumstances, we just go into a job. And that's what these people do. Some of them, they just take a year off to go travel. Since that's not happening these, these years, it's basically they get into training. Um, your training is, so a core training is when you get into, let's just say as in India, MD medicine or um, MS surgery, right? I'm just gonna keep these two as my reference points. There's loads, pediatrics, anesthetics is loads, but I'm just putting it to, into these two reference points for now, all right? If there's any other questions, we can do it at the end. Now, uh, so you have core training, you get into core training. Now, for medicine, the training is three years, which is IMT, that is internal medicine training. This is three years, whereas for your surgical training, it is two years. After you finish your IMT of three years, you need to complete your MRCP by the time you finish these three years. And as long as with your core training, if you finish your surgical training for two years, you need to finish your MRCS. Now, as in India where we have, okay, you know what, I'm MS surgery, or you know, I've just finished MD medicine, or let's just say I'm MD pediatrics. I am now okay and done to be like um, a specialist or I can be an associate professor or assistant professor. You know how that goes. You can actually start working as a post MD, um, person but over here you cannot after core training whether it's you finish um, after your medicine or your surgical core training or any other core training whatsoever you cannot cannot work in the UK just saying that you are post MRCP because that is not enough you will go back to being a junior doctor that's why ST3 to ST8, which is specialist training, is very important here. Now, in specialist training, we say, let's just say for medicine, you can get into dermatology or you can get into gastroenterology or hepatology. All of this, you need to be a specialist because just finishing core training is not going to be sufficient enough. Even with surgery, after you finish your MRC, uh, MRCS and you're done with your CST, that is core surgical training, you come out and you're just like, okay, what can I do? You have to get into specialty training, which is either, let's just say, colorectal surgery or HPB surgery or upper GI or breast surgery, endocrine. So there's a lot of differences over here. This is definitely a little bit of a difference from uh, the United States where you finish your residency three years and then you can either get into a fellowship, but even without that, you can still still start working as um, an attending or you can get into, eventually you can get into a consultant post, but that doesn't work here. Yes, the numbers look scary. Yes, SD3, SD28, that is basically about five years of training. It depends on each person. It could be about five to, ten, um, five to eight years, depending on which 
specialty you train in but a total with ct um, that is core training and specialty training you will have about about 10 years of study i know it is a little bit oh my god do i really want to study for 10 years but in the uk it's always about getting your knowledge always up to date i'll tell about that it's a little bit of a check box in the uk after you finish your specialty training there's something called the certificate of completion of training this is called the cct cct is after you finish your training you some um specialty training have an exam that you need to complete like if it's your if it's for surgery you need to finish your frcs to get a certificate of completion of training so you finished your mrcs in core training you finished your frcs in specialty training and as soon as you're done with that you are eligible to be a consultant so this is but whereas in cardiology there's no there's no um exam after you finish your specialty training so it's your consultant who's actually looked after you between st3 and st5 i think i'm not quite sure how long um cardiology is um they will have to rule off your comp competency they'll be like okay you're competent enough to be a consultant that's when you can actually go ahead and be like okay now i can be a consultant right so this is the levels of the doctors in the uk things change it's always um it is way more vaster than this if we start getting into it i can actually keep going uh but because we have a time constraint i'm going to just keep it as it is yeah this is just a just that you need to know so whenever you finish your plabs and you're done with the plab and you're just like you can always get into fy2 because we've not done a second year of internship but if you've worked in india you can either get into an fy2 post or it's something as i said there's an fy3 which is basically a senior house officer it's like a an intermin job between a uh, post internship and before you start your training okay i hope everyone's actually understanding what i'm saying if i'm too fast please let me know i'm absolutely okay to slow down um or like you know if you're not understanding anything we'll come to that at the end okay so next gp a general practice now um many people um honest honestly many people do not understand what a gp is and what a gp does you do not as in india where we go oh i'm going to go to do gp in this place just for like you know a couple of days that is not the case over here whatsoever a gp is some somebody who's completely different who's actually got a proper training period let me tell you how it works in the uk how healthcare works in the uk um let's just say you live in manchester you live in this very specific part of manchester now in manchester what will happen is you have this one place that you'll be like okay i'm here and you will have a gp for that area which is a general practice for that area in that general practice you have you have a lot of doctors so that is your primary care doctors right they are the ones who actually look after you they know everything about you you go to them first if there is anything in india when you have a let's say ankle pain or knee pain we directly go to the orthopedics right but over here it's not like that you do not go to the orthopedics you go to your gp the gp first looks at you he assesses you and then he says okay fine i'm going to give you all of this if it doesn't work come back and then we'll refer you to an official specialist or something like that so gp is a doctor who who works in the primary care settings they don't work in a hospital at all they work in a clinic which is basically a general practice in your area if you have any issues you go to them first they are the ones who, who also do your screening programs and um, they are usually your first point of contact as i've already mentioned um so they treat everything acute illnesses chronic illnesses so anything you have it always goes through them um let me give you an example you have a 50 year old woman who says okay fine i'm having i'm not feeling that great i just need to go see my gp 
she goes to her gp her gp does and her gp does an ecg and sees completely irregular heart rhythms now because in a gp practice you cannot treat emergency conditions they immediately refer you to the ane either they will call the ane themselves and say listen i am i am sending this woman over i'm calling the ambulance and sending this woman over who needs urgent look by a specialist or who needs urgent care underneath a hospital setting because if something happens uh, we won't be able to cope here which is understandable or so this is basically what a gp does any this is basically what they do all right um now what is a gp trainee or what is a training when you get into um a gp training you actually train for about so gp does not have a specialist trainee pathway so you are done with just co training its co training is 3 years for gp so you finished your gp training which will be about 2 years in a gp practice where you look at other doctors other gps and you learn from them and it will be a one year setting in the hospital just so that you know all the acute conditions and after your gp training you will have to have passed the gp mrc gp as we have mrcp and mrcs we have the mrc gp all of this is definitely like it's all there on google just google mrc gp and if you want to know about it it's all there um what are the pros and cons of being a gp is it's interesting because i've seen a lot of people who come to the uk and say you know what i want to be a um, cardiologist or i want to be a plastic surgeon or i want to be that i want to be this i want to be a neurosurgeon a cardiothoracic surgeon like they all start with so much but then when they come to the uk and they see how a gp works many of them have changed their mind you wouldn't imagine how many but many of them now why they say a gp works 9 to 5 you have no nights whatsoever you don't work on sociable hours that means you don't work on weekends you work just 9 to 5 on monday to friday now there are definitely gps who do clinics on saturday who do clinics on you know they are open for emergency services if you want immediately to go to your gp for something some gps do that they get definitely get extra for that also but a lot of them just work you know 9 to 5 on monday to friday nothing else to do um they have time with their family they have time for their hobbies they have time for traveling so it's a pros and cons as to what you, if you like the hospital setting you know cardiac arrests intubations that this is that definitely gp is not for you because this is not what you're going to see in a gp practice um but if you like seeing people who with regular follow up they are the ones who are going to come keep coming back to you if they live in your locality they are the ones if that is what you like then yes gp is definitely for you okay so we've talked about gp practice and i've got in a oh i have i have one of my, my juniors also here hi kuti um i uh, there's pay of the gp i'll come back to that cuz i'm going to talk about pay of all the doctors in the uk so i'll come to that um but before that let me just move to the next one okay as we said how much does a uh, doctor earn in the uk and whether is it, it is sufficient now i had told you about the fy1 fy2 that is your internship period we get a stipend that concept of having a stipend is definitely not there in the uk it is a proper salary you are paid for what you do in the uk you're not given a stipend of about like just say in internship you go and you're like oh i've got like let's say 3000 rupees or 4000 rupees or i don't know how much it is now but you know how it varies for a lot of people um in the uk as an intern you get paid um now let's just start up 
an FY1, an FY1 gets paid between 28,000 to 32,000 pounds. This is a basic salary. Um, what I mean by a basic salary, this is your base pay. In the UK, there's a contract-based system that is any junior doctor, regardless of how much experience you have, you get paid all the same. There's no difference. Everybody gets paid the same. Because if you are in that position, if that is your title, that's it. So if you have, let's just say, three years of post MD experience in India, and then you come here, and then you get into, let's just say, an FY3 post, as I said, a lot of people take an interim year just to work. If you come into that post, your pay is going to be as a CT1, CT2, which is 38,000. You're not going to get more than that because you have experience. You're not going to get less than that. Some trusts though. So some hospitals, they do look into your experience and they kind of adjust things here and there, but it's not everybody. A basic junior doctor's pay for an FY1, FY2 is between 28 to 32,000. Now, whereas coming to a co-training or let's just say even a non-training job. If you come into the UK and you come into the UK and you say, you know what I've done, I'm going to do uh, an SHO job, a senior house officer job, or I've done my plabs, you know, I'm not going to get into training now. Let me just try and get for a job. You are actually in the position of a CT1, CT2. So you get paid 38,693, that is your base pay. Now, if you change all of this into the um, Indian rupees, it's definitely about two, three lakhs, three lakhs and above. Um, and this is, things differ when you are, let's just say if you're in London or if you're in um, Oxford, or if you're in one of those cities that actually has a higher amount of, let's just say your rent is higher or the cost of living is absolutely high. Then you get something called weightage. Now, because I'm in London and because um, London is very expensive, you would not believe how expensive London it is. Uh, let's just give you a, a small idea. A, to rent out a one bedroom, one bedroom, I'm not even saying one bedroom house or studio, nothing. It's one bedroom. You will have to pay a minimum of about 500 to 700 pounds per month. That is your minimum. And you will get about, let's just say 2,500 pounds in your hand. And out of that 700, 500 goes for one bedroom. And it's not like you'll have uh, the washroom or the, um, within it, no, that is separate. And you will have to share. So there's one kitchen, one hall, maybe one bathroom that you have to share with others. So cost of living in London is definitely high. That's the reason why a lot of London trusts do give something an extra bonus called the London weightage. And that's it. That is your extra bonus for you to sustain yourself in the UK. Right? Um, and... ST3 to ST8, that is your specialty training. Um, that definitely people do get according. So towards the start of ST3, 4, you get about 49,000. And then as you go up, I think above 7, as you are 7 and 8, you get 52,000. That's the base pay. Now, after this comes your consultants. Now, consultants actually have a very, very different pay scale. Consultants usually go from, if you are a consultant in anything, does not matter if you're a surgeon, a pediatrician, an emergency physician, absolutely does not matter what you are. You will get paid between 82,000 to 110,000. Again, tax is also there. So tax is taken off. NHS pension is taken off. That's all there. But I'll tell you, it is absolutely sufficient for you and probably another person to sustain yourself and live an okay life with this money. Now, let's just say in 
somebody had i think had somebody put in put in a group into uh sorry somebody had put into the chat as to what is the pay of a gp a pay of a gp is completely completely different now you'll be asking why they're doctors too they've also trained yes they have but they do not work weekends they do not work um nights so their pay is a little less that is about so the first year after you've just become a consultant it's about 60 60000 and then as and when you go like you know with more years of experience or second year third year fourth year you get a maximum pay of 91000 i know this is a little bit different from the 110000 that i actually told you about for the consultants who are anything else in the hospital setting but that's because they work nights they work weekends they are on call and as a gp you're not on call now saying that i'm lot of gps do work extra shifts um a gp can you know adjust the way they work like if i'm a gp i can say you know what i want to work only 3 days a week or i want to work only 4 days a week and you get paid according to that it's not like you're not going to get paid for that but if you say i've worked only 3 days i think i can go in for another shift if there is another shift available uh or not in your gp practice or some other gp practice and if they've taken you then yes done deal you are you go, go there you get into um, do the practice for a day and you get paid extra so there's always a flexibility in working as a general practitioner because you kind of set your rota you kind of you kind of understand you work with other gps and you make it as flexible as you want now um, many women i'm not being very you know gender related here but i'm saying many women actually prefer this because they actually get to sit at home with their um children saying this i've seen women who are surgeons and their husbands or partners or boyfriends or whoever it is um become a gp so that they can stay home with their kids so it's a it's a completely vice versa thing and it's completely understanding if you your partner wants to be a surgeon and they'd be like you know what i can't be a sir i can't do the hustle and the bustle and wake up at nights and go and do the surgery because my brain doesn't work i'm happy being either a pathologist because a pathologist doesn't work 9 to 5 or a gp because like sorry a pathologist only works 9 to 5 or a gp who works only 9 to 5 i'm happy being that it is completely your choice there is no stopping you the pay yes as i've said it's different but it depends on how you work how you live your life also if you're absolutely luxurious you can take up some extra shifts make up that money if you want if you don't care about savings that's fine because you are your boss you understand and you know whether you want to save whether you don't want to save whether you don't want to do that a lot of people here a lot of british medical graduates don't save at all because they're just like life's too short and it's right life is absolutely short so that's my very very gist on the pay scale and the consultant pay scale i've avoided putting in this um slide is just because of the fact that i know a lot of people do want to um a lot of people are not consultants as yet so this is just a basic for all of us yeah um so i think some people been asking what is the take away money excluding tax and pension money so as 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 i said as a junior doctor you can get paid between 2500 to 3100 3200 but this is your basic pay if um because um so let's but that basically includes london weightage if you're not in london if you're somewhere outside then your basic pay would be between 2500 and let's just say 3000 you just get very little for being in london actually you don't get major goals so you just get this but it's sufficient because outside london outside london there's as i said you know one bedroom is 500 700 pounds outside london you will get a three bedroom house for about 700 pounds so you see the difference there's a big difference as i said like being in london or being in oxford or being in one of the most the you know places that actually have a very high cost of living than being in manchester i i i remember like pre covid way pre covid i went to one of my friends house and they live in a three bedroom house and it was 700 pounds they are um 
rent was 700 pounds and i'm just like you cannot get a three bedroom house living in london for 700 pounds no way um somebody has asked what are the tuition fees oh guys there's no tuition fees there's absolutely no tuition fees you pay for your flat one you pay for your flat two you pay for your gmc registration and then if you want to get into training there's no tuition fees you get it on your own merit you get it on the basis of your cv on the basis of how you've performed in at the interview how your ranking is and that's it there's no tuition fees you do not pay crores and crores of money to get into md medicine or md pediatrics or ms surgery or radiology even no you do not have to do that you just need to work on your cv work on a lot of other things and that's it it's on your own merit right i'm just going to complete um the thing first and then we'll go on to the questions yeah sorry about this i just need to complete this before we run out of time and uh, the rc medic crew basically kicks me out <laughs> specialist pathway now especially you um other than the plab pathway a lot of people do get also uh, do go through a specialist pathway which is if you finished md medicine or if you finished M ms surgery and you want to get into the uk you can but you have to complete your mrcp or mrcs or something equivalent um i think even anesthesia has its own exams or something like that i'm not quite sure about that but this is basically how it is you finish your mrcs and then you can get into the uk you don't have to give your plabs it's because mrcs is a valid degree in the uk and anybody with that qualification can easily apply for any job um as in the job of your choice and you'll get it little bit about this um what is let's just say mrcp i've not done more uh, i've just done mrcp and mrcs here i've not given i've not gone more into detail about anything else including mrcgp because that's a as i said if i start talking i can keep talking so an mrcp is usually done during ct1 and ct2 training as i said when you are in training whether it's co training for internal medicine or whether it's co training for surgical training Uh, for surgery you need to finish your mrcp or mrcs it's only after that because this is an eligibility criteria for your st3 applications you will not be taken you will not be even considered for your st3 applications if you do not finish your mrcp or mrcs mrcp 1 uh, so the three exams for mrcp 1 uh, for mrcp is 1 2 and 3 your first one is an os uh, is a what was it it is a multiple choice question sorry it's a multiple choice questions and you need about 12 months of post graduate experience for this uh, i think it's about two up two papers three hours each or uh, two papers three hours in total something like that not quite sure guys cuz i have not given my mrcp so i have no idea but the, all of this is available in the mrcp.co.uk website you can definitely get in looking into it mrcp2 is again an mcq based type of questions and paces is the third one which is the third exam which is the oski that is where you have stations where you have to go examine a patient talk to the patient and you know get the diagnosis and everything and you will have an examiner there uh so that's your mrcp your mrcs is the um exam that you need to write after your surgical training um during your surgical training or if you want to get in as a specialist pathway if mrcs for surgical applications so as i've said here mrcs a and b there's only two exams um in comparative to the mrcp where there is three this is two exams in the mrcp uh, mrcs a it's written it consists of two papers total time of five papers with a with break in between and you it's a combined mark which is set that you need to pass that whereas in mrc sb that is your stations that's your oski stations you have two types of knowledge that is going to be tested applied knowledge and applied skills you need a pass in both the areas to pass the entire exam and as soon as you're done with either mrcp or mrcs a um sorry mrcs exams you are officially given a diploma by the royal college of physicians or surgery 
commenting on the fact that you have actually finished his exams. It's an actual, actual graduation ceremony over here. is professional and linguistic assessment board this. In short, AKA guys, this is the PLAB. The PLAB stands for professional and linguistics assessment board this. Um, a lot of the PLABs, complete details of the PLABs will be given in session two as I know. So absolutely everything will be there in that. Um, but giving you a gist, and you need to have ILTS and OET because that is an eligibility to write the PLAB one. So you finish your PLAB one, you that is your MCQ questions, you finish your PLAB two, that is your stations, as, as I said, OSCE. You have to do an epic verification um, that is regarding the fact that where they'll check your primary medical qualification, that is your MBBS certificate. The reason why they check that is because they just need to know whether you've done it from a college that is in the system, um, as in, in the entire system that they know. If it is in there, it's that's fine. They'll tell you the steps as to how to get your college into the system. You get your GMC registration done and that's it. You're done. You search for jobs and you get your job as soon as it's done. <laughs> Obviously, getting a job is getting a little tricky right now because of the whole pandemic. But I am telling you, as I said, I have worked five nights because we are shortage in our rota. The shortage is everywhere. You will find that job. Okay, moving on. And my computer seems to be stuck. Ah, there we go. Okay, my journey. So coming to the fact as to how I ended up here. As you must have noticed that I had, um, as I said in the beginning, that I had done the US assemblies. Um, and then because that didn't work out, I was here. I graduated about five years back, if I'm not, 2016. Okay, I graduated from med school in 2016. Um, and as soon as I graduated, I was hell bent on doing the US assemblies. I would not take anything. I was like, I'm doing the US assemblies. I'm not doing anything else. Don't talk to me. It was a whole fight with my parents. It was a whole fight. They're just like, you do whatever you want. But I'm just saying, try for the needs also. Obviously, I didn't try for the needs at all. I just basically did US assembly. I studied for about five, six months. No, actually, yeah, about five, six months before I wrote my first step because I thought I was absolutely prepared for it. Went in, did my step one. And I think when I got the results, I failed. And that was a big shock to me, especially for a person like me who had never failed any medical exams. This was a big shock to me and I was just absolutely down. It took me a month to actually get myself out of the bed and, you know, be like, you know what, you need to start studying for the need. This is not working out. Go there. Let's just, you know, start working. So that's what I did. I started working and I, I enrolled in need PG classes because I was like, that is how my life is going to be. And I did that. And I remember when I was working, I was working in a &E, and um. I remember, you know, I used to take my book every day. I mean, I don't understand why I used to take my book. It was A&E. It was very busy. But, you know, if I get like two seconds, I would go and I would be like, you know, I'm going to study something. And I used to sit and study. And my consultant used to see this every day. Um, so the HOD of the department, he goes like, you do not like studying for the need. Then why are you even attempting this? I'm like, because I have nothing else to do. Like, I can't do anything else. So he casually mentioned why don't you try the PLABs? And this was around the end of uh, 2017. The end of 2017 is when he's casually mentioned, why don't you try the PLABs? He mentioned this to me in October and I'm writing my IELTS, the first, first IELTS in um, Jan. So that's how my journey went where I Somebody mentioned this to me and I was like, why haven't I heard about this before? Why haven't I heard about the UK before? Why am I saying no to the UK? Went in, I researched myself. I didn't know anybody who came into the UK. I didn't know anyone who was in the UK. Um, there was absolutely nobody to help me. 
But what I did, I did my own research. I went on Facebook, I went on Google, and I just kept Googling things. I kept figuring out whether is this the way I want to go. And I said, let's give it a try. That's how I wrote the IELTS. Disclaimer, yes, I didn't pass my IELTS the first two times. Um, don't ask, my writing just absolutely went down the drain. Every time they would like not get, not give me 0.5 marks, but third time I cleared it. I was like very hell bent on this. I'm like, I'm doing this whatsoever. I got my results, the third results of IELTS, I think by April, booked my PLAB one. See, again, it was pre-COVID with the, you know, PLAB one dates, everything is just out there at that point of time. So it was easier. Yes, definitely easier than how it is now um, because of the lack of spaces and because of the COVID, it gets a little difficult. But I did my PLAB one that year um, in 2018. 2019 was the only date that I got my PLAB two. Got my PLAB two, got registered and got did do was doing a lot of job searches yeah so it took me a year to like from my first IELTS to my GMC registration it took a year and then I remember after my GMC registration I was like okay now time to start searching for jobs and I was very interested in medicine like I didn't want anything else but because of the frustration that I was not getting anything that I just applied for anything and everything I didn't even look at it anything and everything I just kept applying kept applying and that's when I got two two interviews my first interview was in medicine which is in Wales and I thought you know guys this is it I am acing this as usual I had a Skype interview like I'm doing with you guys I had an interview totally bombed it bombed meaning they just they were like are you even talking sense like I messed up my diagnosis I messed up everything and I was just like okay guys this is not happening like totally messed up. But the day after that, I got in call for an interview here in King's College um, Hospital for surgery, that to HPV surgery, which is a completely specialized thing. And I had no surgical experience. Somehow gave the interview. And two days, three days later, I get an email saying that you've been selected. Like, would you like to take the job? And I'm like, yes, I would. Uh, but obviously I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot coming to the UK and trying to figure out like it was difficult because the system is completely difficult. The system is diff different. And, you know, I feel like your med school, especially in India, you learn a lot only once you start working. But over here, the people who are post med school who are in their internship years, they are so confident in doing a lot of things. And I didn't have that kind of confidence when I first came. I was even scared to like do anything. I have not taken bloods in India. I have not taken, I've not done cannulations in India. Like I didn't know anything. I came here and I had an amazing set of colleagues who helped me through it. They would be like, you know what? We'll teach you everything. They taught me how to put a cannula. They taught me how to do, um, how to, you know, not do any type sutures, but a proper official, you know, proper sutures. So now skin sutures, cannulas, bloods, anything and everything, like you have to do it. And you learn. Coming to the UK, you learn all of this. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to be like, you know what? This is not happening. You don't know anything. You need to go. No. If you have a good set of colleagues, everybody's going to take their time and teach you. So this is my journey. I've been here for since 2019 end of 2019 so since here from since November 2019 and um, it's been a year and a half that I've been in the same job in the NHS but I absolutely love it I do not regret not getting the MLE not regret anything okay um, I wish though I knew about the PLAB route a bit sooner because I wouldn't have wasted two years of my life doing nothing but I love it okay so q a right let's start with the q a if it's okay with them rc medic crew are you okay with us to start the uh, q a or no no yes dr ashita you can go ahead i think we have a lot of questions on the in the Thanks, chat box. 
there's a lot of questions in the chat box i'm just going to uh, maximize that do you want and... me to read them out to you um no i think i'm t- um i think i've lost track as to where i need to start from that's the only thing uh let me see right okay guys i'm just going to start from the bottom now like whoever's put in questions now i'll answer that because i kind of lost track as to where i started from so first question somebody's written um i'm a 2019 graduate i'm preparing for plab 1 now and i have two years gap will be applying for 2022 will my gaps be a red flag no your gaps will not be a red flag you can always say that you know you took time off that's what i said i said i took time off for studying for that i got my jmc registration very easily but i would say that you know do something i would say if you've got two years of gap don't take any more gap start working somewhere because you it will be a longer gap by the time you get your gmc registration so do start working do something because over here they really need something called the continual continuous professional development that means you need to be on your feet and keep updating your knowledge every time so that's what they need in the uk and they see that so that's basically one um uh, what what kind of job is needed to do before plug one um what kind of job is needed to do before plug one mm, whatever you can do anything you can do a medical role you can do a non medical role you don't need to be in a job also so it completely is up to you even if you're in a non medical role they if, if when they ask you for references you can say that you were working in a non medical capacity and that's fine nobody's going to judge you over here we've got medical graduates who are ski instructors they've done they are they finished uh, their fy1 fy2 they took like 6 7 months break to become a ski instructor in canada so that was one of the, one of my colleagues who did that i wish i could do that i don't know skiing but i wish i could um does ug college matter in this pathway no they don't care which college you've gone to they don't care whether you've passed your med- you know whether you have a fail in first year or second year they do not care as long as you have a good and your internship matters so while you're doing your gmc registration they are they will look at your internship if you have more than um 20 days gap they'll ask you whatever happens if you have a gap they will ask you why you have this gap but if you have more than 20 days gap they would need an evidence as to why you took that gap why was it more than 20 days so that's the only catch that i would say is in all of this okay so i hope that's answer, i answered your question um is the one year of internship that we do in india considered as one of the years of the foundation in uk yes fy1 is considered as your internship in india so that's covered FY2 if you've done a job after your internship um in India that's considered as FY2 but they don't look at that for your GMC registration they only look at your FY1 that is your internship period and then it depends on your job when you start applying for jobs it depends as to what you apply for so you can apply for FY2 post so that's basically where that little thing comes but it does not matter FY1 is considered as your internship as equal into India. Um all right. I hope that's answered your question Namia. Let me know if I've confused you because I think I tend to confuse myself also. Um after clearing the PLAB exams how do you apply for training residency programs what's the process? I think all of that is definitely coming in later on but it it doesn't um let me give you a little bit yeah that definitely is coming on in session 4 i presume um but let me give you a lo- little bit is as soon as you've done with your plab exams you there's a uh, i think they open the um in november they open the applications in november and it is it is a score based application so they look at your cv and that's how they score you so if you've done port uh, sorry if you've done like audits if you've done research if you've done publications that all each has a score everything is coming in session 4 um i hope i'm right charita if i'm not please do say in the comment box but uh, everything is coming 
and they will let you know about everything as to how to get into residency or training as they call it here. They don't call it residency here. Uh, okay, next. What, oh, right. I've gone through this slide, leave the slide alone. Let us look at this. What is the uh, eligibility criteria for an IMG to apply for plug? You need to have an uh, internship. You need to have a valid internship. But other than that, you need to have passed your med school. So that means you need to have your diploma with you and you need to have your IELTS. IELTS is a very good, uh, very major criteria. IELTS or your OET, they accept both. Um, I preferred IELTS mainly because of the financial reasons and also for the fact that OET was not even introduced when I was doing the PLABS. So then I wish they had introduced that. I would have just got that done, but I wrote IELTS three times. Do you know how that way more than OET? And it would have gone to. Um, so I've answered that, Niharika. Mehroz, um, I was wanting to do a clinical audit in my final year internship. Do you have any recommendations for resources? It's not a practice comment from where I'm from. Uh, an audit is not a practice anywhere, I feel, in India. You do not know what an audit is. But there's no re references that I can say. What I can say is, let's just say, Take a guideline, okay? Example, we, every diabetic is, you know, looked for HPA1C or in, in your ward, if you have diabetics and if they have been, if they've actually checked for their HPA1C, make that a guideline. Okay, listen, HPA1C needs to be looked at. So in your first three weeks, whoever was admitted didn't have their HPA1C look. It might not have, been a criteria as to why they are in the hospital, but it's always good to actually look at that. Make sure you tell everyone or you make sure your consultants know for the fact that like, you know, you need to start testing HPA1C and take your next three weeks data after some time and be like, okay, I've made changes to the fact that why we don't test HPA1C and I've made sure that everybody knows. And then that's your, after three months, that's your data. Recommendations. Um, Definitely, I didn't have any recommendations, so I'm not quite sure as to where to tell you from. All I can say is that I have people help me. So if you do want any, any advice on how to do all of this, I've given my Instagram link on the slide that you all are seeing right now. Um, Anybody is absolutely welcome to DM me and I'll give you a little bit more um, idea as to what this is because in your final year, in your internship, you need a consultant to actually look over your audits because it won't be done otherwise. You need somebody to look over your audits and say, right, you need a consultant sign off. So you need to find that consultant who's willing to do an audit with you. Because being miles away from you, I can't help. Sorry about that, but you need a consultant. Eligibility to take PLABs, I've said that. Resources that you use for, for, to prepare PLAB. What I did was um, PLABable and at that point of time, there was a lot of different 100 and 1,700 questions, sushi, sushianity, sorry, not sushi, sushianity. See, this is when I'm hungry now. Sushianity and stuff like that. But now all of that has been scrapped. You have Plabable and Plab One Keys is the mainstay for everything. And I think this time's um, exam, a lot of people had said about med revisions, but I have not studied med revisions, so I'm not quite sure as to whether I can give you advice on that. Um, can you tell us about the WDOMS? I have no idea what that is. If you would like to like just expand that, I'll answer you. Have you ever given one of the MRCS or MRCP? No, I haven't because I, even though I'm working in surgery, I still want to do medicine. So I'm kind of thinking whether I need to change or whether I'll go in. I, I did apply to the um, surgical training though, but yeah, it was not my year, just saying. <laughs> Which all extra work did you do to improve your CV for the first job? Nothing, guys, I did nothing. I had an absolutely crap CV. Um, like it was by luck that they had taken me. I had didn't have PLS, I didn't have ALS. I worked out of two years, I worked for like three, four months in one place, three, four months in another place. My CV was nothing, no publications, no research, nothing. I had any experience, so 
why they took me you have to go ask my consultant because even i don't know i keep asking and they're just like mm, yeah you know we took you but even i don't know till date i don't know um when should we give bls or acls in the first year or final year after that so bls you can obviously give it and you can take it but acls is something that is not accepted um in the uk they accept only the research council um als that's the advanced life support um and all of that is usually taken only in the uk so i would suggest rather than spending your money and doing acls and something that is the american heart association which uk does not accept is to wait till you come here and do als do we need research to enrich cv it's always good guys research publications posters conferences everything will always enrich your cv do you need it a lot of people have got into the uk without it but in these days i think you need to up your game can we give blood bond during house surgery um a lot of people have asked me this and i think you can um but i'm not quite sure um i think somebody had said that they had given it during the end of their house surgery and i'm sure a lot of people have given it but you need to ask gmc this yourself or look at the gmc website which is gmc.org.uk and they have um a kind of like an mcq type based questions like you say you're an indian medic or you're um, overseas medical graduate and they'll tell you as to what path you can take and you have everything in the gmc so do have a look at that don't trust what i'm saying <laughs> can you do fy1 um your after fourth mbbs or in the, as i said definitely not in the fourth mbbs because you've not graduated as yet i think the thing with um if i remember right i had to provide the dates of when i got my primary medical education <coughs> sorry about that um i've been talking too much my throat is now drying up but um if i remember right i had to give uh, my diploma date so i think it can be done only after internship but please please go check it out because i may be completely wrong yeah the clinical electives in uk add on to my cv yes they do <coughs> sorry any clinical elective in the uk absolutely adds on to your cv it's a little bit difficult to get in these days because no hospitals um, is actually open for clinical electives some of them are most of the clinical electives if you you know email the consultant directly and if they are willing to take you it's usually free but i know some trusts that actually charge it usually should be free guys a lot of people have done it free um do our marks and college matter for usmd matches for us mle um marks for the us mle does matter college i don't think not so much but marks of your step 1 step 2 does matter <coughs> and marks in your college i don't think so you guys have done only step 1 failed that so didn't go in the, down that pathway um mm. if internship is done in any other country other than india is it okay for first year yes it's absolutely okay if it is again as i said you've got according to the gmc they've they've said they you need 3 months of surgery 3 months of medicine is their minimum criteria if you've got this anybody even a person who's in the in america can apply for plab so it's fine if you do a year of bond in india would that count in fy see that that um a bond will usually come in um after fy1 isn't it so that would count that will definitely count it's not any intern any experience will count guys anything if it's in part of a bond if it's part of you just working if it's part of you even working in your friend's hospital or dad's hospital or mother's hospital or you know even working in a phc counts but all of this needs written proof evidence is very important here you need evidence that you've worked so any experience whatsoever counts even if it's non medical you need the, you need evidence and it's counted 
if we do MD MS in India, can we skip PLAB, give MRCS, and will that mean we go straight to ST? So if you give MRCP, MRCS in India, you can apply for ST. Obviously, there's absolutely no issues in applying for ST. Yes, you can apply for a senior registrar job um, over here. No issues, um, but I think what I would do is apply for a senior registrar job, learn the system. The system is very different. So I would learn the system and then apply for ST3 jobs. But ST3 jobs, you can, um, if you're a senior registrar, you won't get. So this is the thing what happens here. A lot of people finish their MRCP, MRCS. They come into the UK as a senior registrar and it's difficult to cope at that point of time. After you work for a couple of years, then you like, as in you work for a couple of years and you're like, okay, fine, now I need to do ST3. You can still apply for ST3, but your CV needs to be in terms with the, with the British medical graduates here because they have everything checked off. Whereas com coming from India, you will not, your CV will not be that enriched, as I would say. I hope that answers your question. Um, but if you want, I can actually look more into that and come back to you. If you just DM me, I will look into that and come back to you. After completing the core training and clearing MRCPs and coming back to India without doing specialty training. <clears throat> yes, I think MRCP and MRCS is definitely counted as a higher graduate, um, this one. And if you do, I'm not quite sure if you'll get an absolute recognition of an MD and MS, but because you've completed MRCP and MRCS, you should. There's no chance that they shouldn't give you because MRCP and MRCS is definitely counted as a higher degree in the UK. And it is accepted in the India also, it, in India also because um, India does have centers for all of this. So you should be able to get, it depends on where you work and how your superiors are. <clears throat> um, yes, it's coming to an episode for, thanks Charita for that. Um, can we give platform during our internship? I've answered that. Do they accept people with disabilities, visual? Depends on what disabilities you have. They are very, very accommodating to a lot of people here with disabilities like visual. It depends on what you have. You need to ask them because there are certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, but they have no, you just need to say that beforehand. That's all. As in declare it um, in your, I think during a registration, even when you're doing a job search, declare it because they can adjust things according to that. Um, is doing research necessary for PLAB? Not for PLABs. You do not need a research just to take the PLAB exams. No. Is settlement good in UK after studies? I mean, it's a very interesting question that you would ask me. I think that is something that you need to decide for your own self. Um, it's good for me. <laughs> um, it's very good for me. But it's something that you do have to um, take a little bit more research into and figure out as to what you want to do. Um, obviously, when I came to when I came from India, the only thing that's actually been a little bit of a hiccup in between all of this is the fact that I've not gone back to India, seen my family for it's been about two years now. That's the only hiccup that is there. I miss a lot of things, but you know, you can't do anything. This is how it is. Hopefully once it settles, I'll be there soon for, for vacations. That's all. <laughs> um, how can a postgraduate do research? Are there any opportunities? As in, if you want to do research in the UK, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of research positions. Um, but if you're talking about in India, you have to obviously look locally or wherever it is in India. You can even do it something with your consultant. But in the UK, there's a lot. There's actually positions that is only for research. Like if you want to become, if you want to do solely research, there are positions in the UK that <clears throat> give you about, I think it's 60% research and 40% clinical time. So there's loads of positions like that also. <sighs> okay, can I do ALS or us while we are in the UK for PLAB2 exam. Yes, you can. There's no there's no cutoff for that. You can if you're in the PLAB, in um, UK, you can. Can you join FY1 as an Indian medical student after fourth year? Yes, you can. If you've not done an acceptable internship, you can join as an FY1. But again, 
it is a little bit different the pathway for that you need your you need your um, dean to give a statement you need to do another exam which is called the sjps you need to pass that and then only you can do your fr1 there's a lot of um, listing on that um <clears throat> i think there's a um website called gnpro if i'm not mistaken i might be um but i've been looking into this because a lot of people have dm'd me saying about this and i've looked into it and they've said there's a lot of criteria for it it opens up in july for next year so have a look if you want um just type in f51 um i think you should be able to google it like f51 eligibility criteria if not dm me i do have the screenshot of what criteria is there um how can an mbbs graduate do research any options <clears throat> how can they do research in india it depends again you need to do you need to ask your consultant or you need to ask the people who are into research to help you out i'm sure if you look into various hospitals there'll be that one person who's always into academics always into the research side of things do ask them uh, research is another topic if i go into it's huge it's <clears throat> something that i won't be able to stop talking if i keep keep talking so then and i think we've run majorly over time so before chartak kills me and cuts the zoom call i'm just going to quickly go through this um what is meant by electives electives is basically a clinical attachment that you can do it in the uk like a taster session like you come in and say that i want to do two weeks or three weeks or even a month in in let's say acute medicine you would it's an observership technically you don't get to do anything hands on because you're not allowed to until and unless your consultant is very nice but usually you will serve it and it's always it's always good for your cv saying that you've actually done something in the uk that un, that shows the consultant whenever you apply for a job that you know you kind of know the system so which is always a plus point I have about five months in nursing cap while I look what I took for neat prep. Can I tell that while registering to the GMC? <clears throat> you can tell that, but every case is different. Five months in nursing cap for neat prep, they will ask you because a lot of students over here, especially, do prep. Any like as I said, they do MRCP or MRCS during their surgical training, so that means they're training as well as they're studying for the exam. um but every case is different gmc has its own way of dealing with people so if you just email gmc they let you know uh so if not that you always have other pathways as i said is there any exam to get into ct after fy2 um nope there's just your cv and your um and your what your cv and your um, yeah your portfolio they look into your portfolio a few of as i said gp had gp psychiatry neurosurgery uh, uh, about 10 specialties do have the msra exam which is the multi specialty recruitment assessment exam but again if i talk about it it goes it's a huge other topic so some other time guys what's the process in getting the uk up to doing ms and uh, msmd india that's very good question after you do an mrcp and mrc yes you need to go to the gmc website and see how they do it i do know a lot of people do get into the place are uh, as in <clears throat> i think for the specialist pathway is where you get a job and that's when they sponsor your gmc registration it's something like that Uh, but again you need your mrcp or mrcs with an md medicine you're still a junior doctor according to them because you haven't done any exams that is equivalent in 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 uk so anupama i hope that's helped you settle after studies good tarshini i think that's a question that i've answered um to settle after studies it is good but it depends some people don't like it when they come here some people love it i do so it depends on each person where do where do you done your lab one in in india or uk whether we have testing center you do have testing centers in the, in india as well you have in delhi chennai a couple more places that i forgot uh, but i did 
not take it in India. I came to the UK and took it because there was nothing left in India when I took it. But yeah, there's testing centers. I think there are five testing centers in India, if I'm not mistaken. Mumbai is definitely there. Chennai is there, Delhi is there. Bangalore. Yeah, there's one more that I forgot, I think. Then you have centers all over the world, Dubai, Sydney, Canada, this, except for the US, I think you have everywhere else. Comfortable income to live as a family in the UK. Now, as a junior doctor, as I've said, it is a comfortable income for you to live with your partner. Um, comfortable life, yes, as a junior doctor. But as you start having family, kids, the expenses do get tight because over here, daycare is expensive, very expensive. I think they earn more than us, right? Nannies and all earn more than us for sure. So um, that's going to be a little tight. It would be really helpful if you and your other half work. Is anesthesia a separate specialty training or is done the surgery? It is separate. Manali, it is definitely separate. Um, it's you have to do either three years of IMD training or you have two years of something called the ACCS training or you can do acute medicine training. It is a completely separate one and it's very highly sought by the way. If I get into UK, is there a possibility that I will end up getting nothing? Ayush, I don't understand that question is to end up getting nothing. Because you need to always work to get something. You'll always, always get something. Um, but don't give up hope. A lot of people do and they get frustrated. It takes time. That's why plan way early. Do not expect to come into the UK saying, I've done my exam now. I'm going to get into the UK in two months time. It does not work like that. It takes time. That's why I said, always refine your CV. Always make sure when you're doing job searches, you always refine it according to their terms and conditions because that's what they look at. After PLAP2, how to get GP um, SV100? I think you meant GP training or I don't understand what GPS is. If it's different, let me know and I'll tell you. But I'm going to just skip that for now. I have done a social work for 240 hours in two years back in school under state government and I have certificate. Can I get it over here? Can I, can I do special training in oncology after GP training? So social work in, you can definitely add it to your CV. There's no nothing wrong with that. Um, definitely add it. You have a certificate for it also, add it. Nothing else. Can I do specialty training in oncology? Oncology is usually um, um, post IMT. Specialty is because oncology is an ST3 to ST8, that area. So after GP training, you can't really do that. Um, but there is something called this GP with specialty interest. So I'm not quite sure if oncology comes underneath that, but I can always have a look. Let me know if you want me to have a look and I'll get back to you. Again, the Instagram is there. What do you do if you what if you want to go back to India after? Do you have to do a, give a screening test? No. If you have to go back to India, you don't have to do a screening test or anything like that. Just go back to India um, and start working. Depends again of what you've done. If you've done your MRCP or MRCS, you can work as a specialist associate, as I've said before. Um, but there's no screening test. How difficult is it to get into the surgical specialties? It's competitive. I'm not saying it's difficult. It's competitive, um, especially for somebody like me who has done one, year, one and a half years in surgery and I did not get through. But again, my CV was not that great. And I understand that also. So it's difficult because there's very limited number of seats. But if you have a will, you can definitely get into it. How to do electives in UK, how to apply and how much will the cost of electives be? Um, so how to do electives in the UK? You need to either email a consultant and see if they're willing to take you on. Consultant's email ID is all there on the on this one, on the Google, just Google, like, you know, I want to do medicine in let's just say King's College Hospital. Medicine in King's College Hospital, they'll give you a list of consultants, just you need to research into it, go a little bit more into it and they'll let you know. Um, <clears throat> how much does it cost? As I've said, it can be expensive and it can be Nothing. So it depends on each trust. Settlement in the UK. Um, I think I've said that settlement in the UK. I don't understand the question. Dashni, if you could just a um, little bit expand that, I can give you another answer. Um, as in, do you mean a PR? Is that what you mean? Permanent residence in the UK. 
let me know darshini yeah why can i get gp with specialty interesting you said a location in india or kolkata hyderabad chennai man oh thanks thanks m456 for that um where can i get a gp with specialty interesting that you said so once you become a gp after you finish your gp training there's a lot of gps that have taken like let's just say aesthetic or minor operations minor options operations will be like incision drainages and things like that so um how to get into that is definitely after you do your gp training you have other options of doing little little courses that makes you a gp with a specialist interest there's another very interesting part about gp is that you can be a portfolio gp now what is a portfolio gp a portfolio gp is a person is a gp who actually does clinical work also but their main thing behind their um this one is not just the clinical work but they actually enhance and help other students expand their portfolios it's an interesting job that i actually recently only knew about it um so if anybody wants to look that up please go ahead um do you work in the hospital or a college during fy1 fy2 it's all hospitals you do not work in a college at all there's no colleges here you do you do you attend a college only for your um as you say mbbs and then for fy1 fy2 anything after that it's all hospitals you might be even given the bleep and yawn call like the first day of your fy1 i know people who have that do we get paid during elective you usually do not get paid unfortunately it's because it's something that you are doing um a lot of people do not get paid because it's it's just something that you are doing for yourself you're not really contributing in medical care or health care then right okay tashni pia yeah, thank you for that so um you need to work 5 years in the uk to get an ilr which is an indefinite leave to remain um that means so let me break this down to you when you come into the uk to work your hospital sponsors you the visa even if you change hospitals the hospital always sponsors you the visa so as long as that visa is valid as long as you work for that hospital that visa is valid but after 5 years of being on that visa you can apply for indefinite leave to remain that means you do not have to be sponsored but you will get an visa from the uk saying that that means you can even be in the uk without working after getting after one year of ilr you can apply for british citizenship you need to just do a couple of tests and then it's a little expensive also i think it's about i think 1000 between 1000 pounds to 3000 pounds for an application but because i've not done it i'm not really sure i remember somebody telling me this but i'll let you know when i do it <laughs> after cst is neuro available as a specialty or is it only run through neurosurgery is usually a run through program it um, you have to give your msr e for that um it's unfortunately not going to be after cst iphone i hope that gives you an idea it is difficult but as i said not impossible you need to just work work and make sure that you know you sell yourself enough that they'll be like you are a good candidate for a neurosurgery trainee post after plab 2 how can i get into gp training as i said after plab 2 you um apply during november they'll open the applications and usually they have an oski station instead of into and interviews but this time because of the pandemic they have only the msra exams which are done and now everybody is just waiting for their results to come out there's any research audit um that you have that you do have to do always no any research or audit that you have to do does not have to be with um the specialty that you're applying to it's always a plus point if it is if it isn't it's fine as long as you've done something that just makes the difference you've done something regardless of what specialty it is it counts but or uh, if if like this time for the medicine um applications they've taken only your portfolio so they will look into it if you've done something related to medicine so it's always a plus point right so do if you can do it if not it's completely fine 
Yes, Charita has definitely put in the post-event form. It is a feedback on the basis of our, how RC Medic Crew has done and how I have done. Please, 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 guys, just fill the form up. It's very crucial um, that you fill it. And hopefully you guys have understood things. And if you've not also, please fill the form and let me know. It's just basically a feedback for myself as well as the RC Medic Crew to understand what further things you would like to do in life oh sorry what would you want to see and how i have done can you do a session about fy1 after fourth mbbs i'm the first year student and i know i've got a long way to go but i do want to get to know the process abed you have a very very long way to go um a session about fy1 after fourth year mbbs i can i'll see if i can do something about that um I'll post it on my Instagram if I'm going to do something, all right? Or if you really want me to keep nagging me, I'll probably do something. Um, yeah, as, our, as Charita has said, please put it in the post event feedback form also. And if not me, somebody else would be able to do it. All right, thank you. Percentage of tax in the UK. So percentage of tax in the UK is varies if you have um right so if you have like a it depends on your salary if it's between something and 50000 pounds a year 20% of it goes into tax if it's above 50000 pounds of 60000 pounds it's 50% goes into tax so yes tax is a big thing but that's because your healthcare is free um but that's about it. Um, thank you so much, Mary. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. All right, guys, I think this is it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, happy, what about UKMLA? Is it different? So UKMLA has not been into process as yet. It will start what they are saying by 2022, between 2022 to 2024. Nobody really knows what it is, but what I've been hearing rumors is technically the same thing. They just making maybe a little bit more difficult and but nobody knows until it starts or just wait for GMC guidelines to come so that you know you understand as to how it works I'm obviously looking into it I'm waiting for them to actually post some guidelines as to how the um, thing is going to be if it's going to be any different or if it's going to be same as flabs and we'll get to know from there all right vast program Ooh, m456 very nice question a vast program is completely different again if i start talking into it it's going to be a very long topic but it is an fy2 training post that's all you need to know it is technically for you to get into a training post of fy2 rather than a non-training post uh, I'll post something on that on my Instagram. If you want, just DM me if you want. And that's basically it. I hope there's no more questions because I do feel that I've covered everything. I'm so sorry if I've missed out your question or I've completely given <laughs> something wrong. But um, I feel I've given every, I've answered everything. I hope you really like the session. Thank you, RC Medic Group, for you, like, you know, doing this session. It's been absolutely amazing. I hope all of you have filled out the post, the feedback form, because that gives me and them like a good, good understanding of how you felt. So cheers guys, <laughs> that's from me. Do the, please, please, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate, always DM me. I'm absolutely happy to answer anything, anything. Like I always answer people back, so. <laughs> DM me or ask um, the RC Medic Crew team for anything. They have my number, they have my email, they have everything. So that's it. Thank you, guys. I've spoken a lot, Charita. <laughs> Thank you oh. so much, Dr. Ashita. It was an amazing session. I'm sure we all found it very, very helpful, very informative, and I'm not going to lie, fun also. Um, so thank you again uh so i think that's all we've covered all the questions also um it has certainly helped us all wrap our heads around the whole process you know it's pretty complicated so like uh, dr ashita already mentioned she's on instagram uh by the handle uh, medical diaries by dr ash if i'm not wrong 
Uh, so she yes, shares. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So she shares. I've seen her page, and it's fun. It's informative. She shares snippets from her journey, and uh, you know, here and there about the whole flap pathway. So I'm sure all of you will find it useful. So please do check her page out. Uh, I think that's all from our side. Also, thank you guys for staying till the end. And please do fill up the post event form and do leave your feedback. And if there are any specific topics that you would like us to take up, please do mention it in the a uh, form. And also, like I said, we will be dividing this whole lab or UK season into four to five episodes. And I will be sending out the. Topics started out for each of the sessions in the uh, WhatsApp groups, so you can um, yeah decide which ones you want to attend. So that's all. Um, I hope you all had a good time. And Dr. Rashida, thank you so much. We are very very grateful. Thank you, Jayata, for all of this. And guys, um, hope you've had a very nice time. I can see my dad's in this group. <laughs> What's up, Rashida? I can see my dad's name, <laughs> um, but. Thanks, guys, so much. Um, it's been amazing to talk to all of you. So, have a nice Sunday. I've taken up about one and a half hours. Gone way over time, uh, but taken one and a half hours of your time. But thank you, and see you guys. Yeah, that's all from our side. I think we're good to go. Thank you. Bye.